I'll tell you guys when we go live. Give me one second. You can't play that run and then expect me to sing right after that. I was just, you just sauced me just one time. Just hit me with the humble pie. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. That limited octave room up here. All right, I'm broadcasting now, and I'm gonna go. I'm gonna mute myself. People in here saying hi. Hi, people. Hello. Hello, and welcome to Yes Ants Digital Earth Day Summit, hosted by eco lifestyle entrepreneur and my mother, Marcy Zeroff. Thank you so much for spending your digital Earth Day with us. And now, introducing Alex Iono, an LA based multi hyphenate singer songwriter, instrumentalist, actor, with a global following on social media that exceeds 12 million fans. Iono24 first rose to fame releasing mashups on his YouTube channel, which have since amassed over 1 billion combined views, and is now gaining even more traction starring his first feature film on Netflix, writing for other platinum recording artists soon to launch an iHeartRadio podcast while continuing to release new music. Welcome, Alex. Oh man, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Happy Earth Day. And, uh, and I'm, yeah, I'm just excited to be playing some songs. Shout out to Yes Ann for, for having me here and, and welcoming me to the family. I'm gonna start off with uh, my brand new song that I just released on Friday. It's called Filling Shoes. <clears throat> he ain't me, she ain't you. They make love while we make do. A kiss won't fix an open wound. So are we swept up off our feet? Or filling shoes? Filling, 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 filling shoes. Don't you hate it when you're driving past the whole foods that we used to roll to? You never had an acai bowl till I showed you. It's crazy how something so new turns to go to. Yeah. And don't it suck when you know you're about to see me? Shit ain't ever easy. You bought a new dress from free people, but you don't speak freely. Or else you would have told me that you really need me. Cause I found love. So I thought you did too But he ain't me And she ain't you They make love while we make do Kiss won't fix yeah. An open wound So are we swept up off our feet Or filling shoes, yeah Feeling, 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 feeling shoes. Yeah. And don't you hate it when the past has to stay back? You've been on my mind just like a Dodgers LA hat. Hard to move on when my mind finds its way back. I'm Rick Ross and you're the Maybach. Cause I found love. So I thought and you did too. But he ain't me, yeah, and she ain't you. They made love, love, while we made do. A kiss won't fix, yeah, an open wound. So are we swept up off our feet? Or filling shoes, yeah. Filling, 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 filling shoes. Feel 
feeling, 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 feeling shoes. No. Feeling, 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 feeling shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really think about this, but when I put together the songs that I wanted to sing for Earth Day, somehow they all ended up being breakup songs. So I'm just going to kind of dedicate all of my breakup songs to how much I miss going to the beach and like going climbing outside and all of that. This next one is called Thinking About You. Or it's not ready yet. And now it is. Yeah. Listen. All right. Yeah. How do I face this? Everything's changing on a no-talk basis. And all of these spaces slowly replacing all the things that made us when you walked out that door. It's like the corner that you lost in the space right between the side door and the front seat of your car. So close, but you're so far. So close, but you're so far. I'm thinking about you. Hey! I've been up, I've been down, I've been lost, sleep around, thinking about you. Waking up on the couch because the bed doesn't feel right without you. I've been up, I've been down, I've been lost, sleep around, thinking about you. Thinking about you. All of this silence. I'd rather be fighting. At least I see your eyes when I push you too far. Yeah. And now I'm realizing that everything I did, you used to be my right hand before you went too far. Yeah. It's like the corner that you lost in the space right between the side door and the front seat of your car. Yeah. So close, but you're so far. Yeah. So close, but you're so far. I'm thinking about. Yeah, I've been up, I've been down, I've been lost, sleep around, thinking about you. Yeah. I'm waking up on the couch because the bed doesn't feel right without you. I've been up, I've been down, I've been lost, sleep around, thinking about you. I'm thinking about you. I can't function, not for nothing. I wake up and I think about you. I wish that I could switch the subject. Think of something else, but you are. Yeah. Wish I could cut you off, but I'm too involved. Pictures on my phone feeling like you're so close, but you're so far. Yeah. So close, but you're so. Cause I'm thinking about yeah, oh, yeah. Hey, it doesn't feel right without you. Oh, oh, I've been up. I'm thinking about, cause I'm thinking about you. Yeah, I've been up, I've been down, I've been lost, sleeping around, thinking about you. Waking up on the couch, cause the bed doesn't feel right without you. I've been up, I've been down, I've been lost, sleeping around, thinking about you. I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about you. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I guess I'm singing breakup songs because I miss um, going outside. I miss going to the beach. I miss rock climbing. Mm. But I will say it is very, very beautiful seeing um, the silver lining to this quarantine, the silver lining to all the social distancing, staying home not going out and driving our cars and and um and and filter uh, 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 filling up like parks with littering and all that like being able to look at the canals in venice and the um all of the uh, reports of how how great our environment is doing right now it's really beautiful to see um but it doesn't make me miss going outside any any less like i i still miss it so much um this last song that i'm going to perform is actually uh, uh one of my favorite songs I've ever written. I wrote it with one of my best friends and uh, it's about uh, missing somebody. <laughs> I guess we're still, uh, I guess we're still missing people. I'm still missing her. Uh, this is Unloving You. I wish I could unsay the words I say I wish I could unsee the videos 
in my head and if i could untie the knot unhear the promises that you forgot would i do that would i and i wish i could unkiss your dirty mouth I wish I could unbite the peach and just spit it out. Oh, if I could undo the shame of ignoring my friends who told me you're insane, would I do that? Would I? Cause I'm loving you is the hardest thing to do, yeah. Wish I could find a way to be unlucky. Loving you, you're all I want to lose. But every night I'm closer to the truth. I just can't unlove you. Maybe I can't unlove you. And I wish I could unfeel your skin. I wish I could undrown these feelings and learn to swim. Oh, if I could unlock the gate and unlight the fire that you put in me, would I do that? Would I? Cause I'm loving you. The hardest thing to do. Wish I could find a way to be unlovable. I'm loving you, oh, all I want to lose. Every night I'm closer to the big truth. I just can't unlove. Maybe I can't unlove you. Falling, I can't help myself. The hardest thing to do. Wish I could find a way to be in love with you. Yeah, oh, I'm loving you. You're all I want to lose. But every night I'm closer to the bigger truth. I just can't unlove you. Maybe I can't unlove. Guys, thank you so much for having me. Happy Earth Day. I hope you can get a little bit of sun. I'm about to go outside, honestly, and just enjoy the beautiful day um, that we have here. Thank you again to Yes And. Have an enjoyable, amazing rest of this um, uh, summit, and uh, hopefully I can talk to you guys soon. Peace. Hello. Thank you so much to Yes And for having us here today and hosting this amazing Earth Day Sustainability Summit. My name is Brittany Carbone. I'm the founder and CEO of Tonic, a plant-based wellness brand rooted in sustainability, transparency, and intention. Uh, we have our own farm in upstate New York where we hand cultivate our crop, focusing on the fullest development of the flower from which we extract our product. Uh, our mindful approach means we only grow what we need to sustain ourselves and uh, focusing on the fullest development of the flower from which we extract our product. Uh, so we use um, very sustainable, regenerative agricultural practices such as um, complementary planting to, uh, to um, plant complementary herbs and botanicals to act as natural pesticides. Uh, we plant cover crops on the off season to revitalize the soil. We um, really take a lot of care to make sure that we are practicing the most um, sustainable and regenerative ways to bring our products um, to the people. So our products are really all about showcasing the power of plants and harnessing the power of nature. So Earth Day is definitely a big deal for us and we're very happy to be here. We're really excited to kick off today's summit with a sound bath from the one and only Sarah Oster. So Sarah is a world-renowned sound therapist, meditation teacher, and author. Named as a top meditation expert by Oprah Magazine, Sarah has been bringing sound baths to modern culture for the past decade, introducing the power of sound and deep listening to people all over the world. 
guiding participants through the therape therapeutic and healing benefits of, a sa of sound in a modern approachable style. And as a leader in the health and wellness space, Sarah regularly shares mindfulness, deep listening, and sound therapy techniques as a facilitator, working with high touch brands such as Google, Microsoft, and American Express. Sarah actually has a new book out now called Sound Bath, Meditate, Heal, and Connect Through Listening, where she guides you through self-inquiry using sound as a tool to transform experience and for forge deeper connections. Hope everybody enjoys this amazing sound bath by Sarah Oster. Thanks. Great. Hi, I'm so honored to be able to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day with you with a sound bath. It's a very important time right now that we feel connected not only to ourselves and to each other, but also to this earth, to this planet on which we live. And so we're going to take a moment now to get really quiet and really still so that we can take in and feel the connection that we share, even though we're not in the same room and not in the same space, we are connected. So I'd invite you now to come to close your eyes. There's no need to look at me, look at the screen for the next 15 minutes. Just allow yourself to get comfortable, to soften, and settle. Feel the weight of your body settle and begin to notice your breath. Notice the steady, gentle rhythm of your breath as it moves in and out of your body. And now we'll take three more intentional breaths together as a group, as a collective. And it goes like this. I'll count to four for an inhale through the nose. And then we'll exhale with an S H sh sound until all the air is out. So let's do that together. Inhale one, two, three, four. Exhale. Again, inhale, one, two, three, four. Exhale. And one more collective breath, inhale, one, two, three, four. Exhale. Return back to the natural breath, in and out through your nose. And now gently turn your attention toward your listening. Observing and noticing the sounds that are already in your environment. There'll be sounds from my environment here in New York City as well. In addition to the sounds that I'm introducing into the experience. And I invite you to allow all of those sounds to layer in to be part of your experience. And just keep gently guiding your awareness back to your listening.
Place your left hand over your heart and your right hand over your left. And take a moment here to think about something that you wish for the earth right now. Holding it here in this soft space in your heart. And to close, let's take one more breath together in through the nose. Exhale through the mouth and gently release your chin to your chest, connecting your head and your heart, your thoughts, your feelings to your actions. And then very gently come to release your hands slowly open your eyes, taking in the light of the room, taking in your surroundings. Thank you so much for pausing with me to take a moment to share this peace and calm together. I hope to see you again soon. Sending love. Thank you so much. That was beautiful, grounding, and an incredible way to celebrate my favorite day of the year, which is Earth Day. Now introducing our moderator for this evening, Women's Wear Daily's sustainability reporter, Kaylee Roshitish. I believe I'm on now. Thank you so much, Jade. Thank you so much, Alex. Sarah, I feel like I was just on an emotional roller coaster in the best way possible. Um, it's everything that I want for Earth Day. Um, 50th anniversary. 
nonetheless. And I have some very accomplished women to introduce. So bear with me, there's a lot here. There's a lot of accomplishments. And so I had to you know, kind of clip out some things, but I'm so excited because we'll have a great chance to delve into that further. So I would love to start with Marcy. Thank you so much for hosting this. Yes And is her newest brand. She is the CEO and founder of Eco Fashion Corp. And she brought all of these wonderful um, speakers, um, attendees together and uh, performances. So thank you so much, Marcy. But I'm not done there. Um, Marcy is our, also the author of Eco Renaissance. And I'm gonna take you on a walk back all the way to 1995. No, it's not that far. Eco fashion, she coined the word. And I think that's incredible because that's not all because she also was instrumental in progressing fair trade, um, global organic textile standards, among many other feats. Um, you have her to thank for getting sustainable and organic textiles onto the shelves of major retailers. She has worked tirelessly and tenaciously to build this movement throughout her nearly three decades in the industry. So thank you so much, Marcy. We also have Amber Valletta. She is a fashion icon, actress, and activist and model, all of those things. Uh, many will recognize her for her screen credits in movies such as Hitch, hit shows like ABC's Revenge and Blood and Oil, as well as countless cover stories. But she's equally known for her work behind the scenes, championing smart consumption and environmental awareness. In 2013, she teamed with Ukes.com to launch Master and Muse, the premier lifestyle brand for a responsibly made, cutting edge fashion. And later she co-founded A Squared Films, a production, production company that aims to inspire social change. Um, in you know many other things, but she's also the newest um, first sustainability contributing editor to British Vogue. Amazing. Uh, we also have Alicia Rayner. She is an award-winning actress, producer, designer, and activist. While she may be best known as Fig in Netflix's Orange is the New Black, for which she won a SAG award, you'll also see her uh, across HBO, FX, iTunes, starring in two award-winning films, Egg, which I think this is incredible. It earned a perfect score on Rotten Tomatoes. I know you all look at that. And equity. Above all else, she's a change maker for women and champion for the environment. She was um, instrumental in Time's Up um, as she was on the Global Leadership Board. Um, she's also an ambassador for Gina Davis Institute for Gender Equality. And re she um, recently just received an award as the acclaimed collaborator um, and a Muse Award made in New York, um, jumbling all the things. Like I'm, I'm telling you people, it's really hard to get all these, these accolades in. Um, she also co-founded a, um, a brand called Lavari, which we'll delve into. It's zero waste, fair trade in New York made. We also have Robin O'Brien, and she's going to take us into the food industry. Um, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but we're, we're crossing all spectrums here. It's not just fashion people, it's food, it's, it's everything, it's, um, yes, and I feel like that was important to say. Um, so many things to talk about, and she's the co-founder of Replant Capital, and um, you may know her for her book, The Unhealthy Truth. She took on some of the world's largest chemical and food companies calling for change, um, including millions seeing her TEDx talk. Truly incredible, and she's done so many other things in the space, and she, um, another book, since we're on the topic, um, Peter, Paul Hawkins' Drawdown, which I know a lot of you have read because you're in this space. Um, she was an advisor too. So many other things. I'm so happy to have you. Um, next, we have Susie Amos Cameron. Um, and I'm not sure how this is appearing, so we'll probably all appear, appear on the screen with our names. So that's, that's very fortunate. Um, it's a little different, obviously, virtually. So appreciate everyone's patience. Um, Susie is an, a noted environmental leader, business pioneer, mom of five, and now grandmother. She is the author of the OMD plan, um, which is basically swapping one meal a day to save your health and save the planet. And she's a founder of this entire movement. Um, another thing that's truly incredible is she founded um, Muse School with her sister in 2005. And for those who don't know this, it's the first 100% solar powered, zero waste and fully plant-based school lunch program and I truly wish I went there. I, I had a dream when I was researching everyone that I did go there, which I wish I could di dive back into that. Um, we all, all have that dream. <laughs> we all have that dream, right? Um, and among many other things, she also launched 
red carpet green dress, which brings me to our next panelist, Samana Pattinson. She is the chief executive officer of red carpet green dress. Um, we're very familiar with red carpet green dress at WWD. Um, and basically this bridges the world of um, you know, the Oscars with these incredible uh, sustainable um, designs, a lot of times upcycled vintage, <clears throat> really important. Um, and she amplifies the brand across numerous media outlets, not just our own. I'm so excited to have you and, and learn more about also um, the tribe, which is um, a global collective um, she founded um, to empower women and empower each other. Um, so many exciting panelists. I, we have one, two more, two more. So many, I mean, again, I can't express enough like how many accolades here that it's like, you know, we could be here, seriously, the whole panel could be this, just me, you know, telling about all of your <laughs> achievements. Um, next, we have Lauren Singer. She is the founder and CEO of Package Free. Basically, the mission is to make the world less trashy. And Lauren really speaks to these values. She, um, maybe you've seen her fitting years of trash into a mason jar. It's truly incredible. Um, you know, I know that we often say uh, progress, not perfection, but Lauren's really, really close. Um, we also have Subin Susan Gr Griffin Black. I, for this, I apologize. She is the founder and co-CEO of EO Products, which are all behind her lovely backdrop. I truly envy that. I feel like I need some essential oils. Um, and so we're, we're gonna talk all about that. Um, basically, you know, you're an early pioneer in the clean beauty and personal care movement. So excited to hear your perspective. Um, and, you know, with that, a lot, a lot of those standards that go within to clean beauty. Um, that's everyone. I'm so excited to bring everyone else on the screen so I stop rambling, but um, I want to ask you this first question because obviously there's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, we also have the, in a few days the seventh anniversary of Rana Plaza, um, which if you're in the fashion industry, you know that this was, um, you know, a very um, jarring um, event and it, you know, really um, a lot of sustainable fashion, um, you know, nonprofits, movements and voices are kind of, you know, spurred from this. Um, and we're also in the middle of a pandemic. I should have started there. There's so much happening. I want to know what's on all of your minds right now. So I'll, I'll kick off. Um, hi, everyone. This is Marcy Zaroff. Um, you know, I, first of all, I just, I want to say thank you to all of these amazing panelists. Thank you, Callie, for moderating. Thank you for all the musicians that are a part of this event. And thank you for all of you for being here because it really uh, does take a village. And one of my favorite quotes, and everyone who knows me knows, I love to, to spit out quotes, but um, one that's very apropos right now is, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, oh God, I can't believe this is the only thing that ever has, and that's Margaret Mead. And this is a village here, and every one of you is part of that village. And as Susie said before this call, let's throw a boulder into this summit so that we can have an absolutely massive exponential ripple effect from uh, what everybody is going to take out of this today. And that is really the vision and the purpose for why I wanted to spearhead this today is really to bring us all together to recognize that business as usual is no longer acceptable, right? We cannot accept what was before coronavirus. And we were on this linear model that was just taking us into nowhere land. And in fact, I would venture to say that I think nature created this. And in some way, this is bigger than we are. This is something that, you know, if we really reflect on, you know, the patterns and the behaviors that we've been perpetuating in our society, you know, we are leading ourselves to, I mean, a, a very dark mass extinction possibility. And as a mother, right, not just respecting Mother Earth today as Earth Day, but as a mother of, of five kids, you know, I want to say, you know, in the, in the words of Native American wisdom, we do not inherit this land from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And we have a responsibility to leave this world as good, if not better, than the way we found it. So I'll just kick off there. Wow. 
Um, well, I had some thoughts as well um, to the question, which was around kind of what we're reflecting on. And for me, I'm really reflecting on the concept of collaborative agility because what this pandemic has really shown me is how the fashion industry, which is kind of, I find quite inherently competitive, has been collaborative in ways that no one could really imagine. You know, we've seen like record response times, factories like repurposing what they're actually making and turning from perfume to hand sanitizers. And we've seen that, you know, a lot of the barriers to sustainability, like the red tape, the bureaucracy, it's almost kind of disappeared overnight in the desire to make impact straight away. And I found that kind of strangely very heartwarming and also it's given me hope because you know we worked with Tesla this year and we you know I was reading about how they turned kind of you know started to provide ventilators for example or you know one of our previous um, collaborators Christian Siriano is starting to make face masks and the speed and agility of the industry is encouraging and I think it shows you that when we need to do something as an industry we do it like and it's a shame and it's a tragedy that it's taken a pandemic but you know earth day as a concept was started because of what the santa barbara oil spill you know it's often taken something like a disaster to really make industry and people kind of move with speed um so the last thing i was really going to say on that was most people are staying at home and to me that is the perfect example of like this global collaboration you know, it's like this shared idea that we're all in this together and we're collaborating to try and at least slow this kind of the spread of this virus. So I think although we're in a really distressing situation, I have hope that we can continue to be agile and collaborative at the same time. I love that. And I'll, I'll just dovetail onto that by saying it for me, the fact that we have all made this drastic life change with such agility shows what's possible. Like a lot of times when people talk about the environment or talk about change, they'll talk about, well, that's too hard or that. And when you look at the, the world and how it has changed in the past six weeks, we see that it's actually quite easy to make massive world change if we decide to and if it feels urgent which it did and climate is urgent mm -hmm. just some people don't realize that and perhaps in this moment we can realize that mm -hmm. additionally i think it's about compassion and it's about love and that if we move from a place of love and compassion you know i i chose to stay home to protect those i love um which is really the world and if we continue with that energy if we continue with that energy of there's no blame there's no evil force we just are all choosing to take action with love, anything is possible. And we really can reverse so much of the damage that has happened, which by the way, has happened in these five, five weeks, six weeks. You know, when you hear any of the statistics about air quality and all of these wonderful things that have happened environmentally in this choice. Mm -hmm. I'd like to um, piggyback on exactly that because I think there was a, a moment about, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago when I started seeing that and you almost in a funny way because so many people are suffering so terribly, yet there are these amazing silver linings happening. And, you know, where there are fish in the, the Venice canals um, our carbon footprint is, you know, being slashed dramatically because nobody's driving and nobody's flying. Um, and just being able to be still and reflect. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a, I've got four teenagers under my roof right now. <laughs> and they are happy. It's the weirdest thing. And I just think it's because we're all together and we're cooking together and we're creating together and teaching each other so many different things. And, 
you know, the idea of, yeah, adapting and adjusting and the word that keeps coming up for me is pivoting. Mm -hmm. I watched with such amazing pride all of our teachers at New School. We closed the school on a Thursday and Monday morning we were up and running with a full-blown virtual school. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's extraordinary to, to watch how people are doing that. And I've actually seen more people over these past six weeks. I mean, like you guys, right? I've seen more people by using Zoom than I've been able to see in, you know, six weeks of, you know, driving somewhere and having a meeting or having phone calls. And it's pretty, <coughs> I just almost feel like we're connecting more. I think um, that I'd like to sort of, that's a perfect um, sort of segue into rethinking technology. In, it, it feels like a renaissance of connectivity in the way that we always thought mm -hmm. that this was the good, this is technology at its best, is being able to connect all of us. And <clears throat> over the past 15 years, it's lost a lot of that because of um, monopolization and loss of privacy and what it's doing to our kids. And so we, you know, I, I've been focused more on what it isn't doing and how it isn't fulfilling its initial purpose and the goodness that it could do. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I've seen from this past month, the sort of a renewed perspective um, and beauty about the possibility in this connection when it's used the right way. And I also think that the, um, this reminds me a bit of being on retreat. And when, for me, when I'm on a silent retreat, <clears throat> which I haven't had the chance to do much in the last 10 or 15 years, but when, for, when you're sitting for seven days, the hardest day is the third day. And for me, it's like every day, you know, for the first two weeks was like the third day. I just couldn't believe, except it, when, <laughs> when you're in, when I'm in retreat, the, the, one of the other hard things about the third day is I had a choice and I made the choice to be here. And then it's like, I, I can't believe I chose this. With this, you know, we, we make the choice out of kindness and connectivity. But the other thing I've noticed that with limited choices, it really, there's less, there's less FOMO, there's less nervousness, there's just a way to settle because we're all in it together. And that's been really beautiful and surprising. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just uh, piggyback on that in saying one of my favorite things that I heard through this whole time was uh, a very, very wise spiritual speaker saying, it's like we're all on a meditation retreat that we didn't know we signed up for. <laughs> and some of us are like, great, meditation, <laughs> like, so, like I'm, I'm all in. I'm like, okay, I'm here. What am I going to learn? How am I going to grow? And for me, it's been very much about if I stay in the moment, it's beautiful and amazing. If I look at the past or the future, I'm fucked. <laughs> That's really the truth of this experience. <clears throat> like mm -hmm. it is, I ha it, it is forcing me to stay in the moment. In the name of this Yes and t-shirt, not to show you my boob here, but be yes. now. Yes. 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 Now. <laughs> and, um, you're excellent and, at transitions. Like you're just yeah. making this so easy. It's like, well, to dovetail, to piggyback, I'm like, well, this is just beautiful. This is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, it, it, I'd love to hear um, what you have just to add to this and Lauren as well. Yeah, for me, um, I think it's a really amazing time because it's the first time ever we have, have had an intersection of pastoral values in the technological time. So many of us have the privilege of an excess of time right now because we don't have commutes traveling to and from meetings, events, places. And 
for the first time with that excess time, we have the ability to learn new skills. And so many of us are reverting back to skills that our ancestors and our grandparents uh, used to do, like baking bread, cooking more, learning how to make new things, learning how to sew, doing crafts. Um, so I think it's beautiful that this is uh, pushing us to, to do all of these things. And now because of technology, you know, in the past, if this happened, we'd, we'd be beholden to our homes and the books and the things that we have. But now we have the ability to have a surplus of time, but the infinite amount of information, resources, and tools that we need to learn how to do just about anything that was ever thought of or perceived by human beings ever. Um, and I think that's really amazing. I also think for everyone that's that's on this talk, you know, we've all been in the, the climate movement for quite some time. And we all know that uh, exactly what's happening right now is 100% what scientists have been telling us that we need to do for decades. And it's, you know, while this is a, a really tragic time and people are getting sick and people are passing away, you know, at the same time, people pass away because of pollution and climate related uh, impact every single day in quantities much larger than we're seeing from coronavirus. And so I think, you know, while I'm, I'm taking time to, to mourn people that are passing from this uh, tragic virus, I'm also taking a moment to be grateful and have gratitude for this catalyst for, to Marcy's point before, for this rest that I think, you know, might have been started by nature as a, as a reason for us to sit home uh, cut our pollution and have the impact on the planet that we've needed to, to have for, for quite some time now and that scientists have been urging us to have for quite some time now. So, um, you know, tragedy aside, I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to, to let our planet rest. You know, I would, I would add to this as I listen to all of you guys, the privilege that we have to stay home, the privilege that we have to show that love. I mean, truly, it is a love story that we're witnessing in real time. And I think the reason we've come to that love is because prior to that, we went through all these different emotions of sadness or anger or grief or fear. And the reason that you feel all of those negative things is because at the base is love. And so, you know, here we've been given this pause and this opportunity to demonstrate that love. But that is also a privilege, but it's also given us the, the opportunity to stop and recognize those on the front line whether it's the teachers at Susie School or the farm workers who are in the field or the nurses who are working in the hospital, those who are not at home, who aren't able to take the time to pause. It's also, it's absolutely showing our love for them and also valuing them. And I think in some cases, we're recognizing the value of those, of those players in the system that we all share. A lot of them are being valued for the very first time. 100%. I think um, everything that you're that you all are saying, you know, you, you speak about facts. I mean, the you know World Health Organization um, put out a report in January. Every year, the world spends far more responding to disease outbreaks, natural disasters, and other health emergencies than it does preparing for or preventing them. Um, and like I said, that was that was a January report from uh, from WHO, and which were all looking to religiously now for what guidance to wear, you know, to wear a mask, you know, things like that. Um, so it's absolutely true. I think, um, Alicia, you made the point earlier about urgency and why don't we view this as an urgent, um, you know, problem. And I think, um, you know, with all this time, as you all have been saying it, it's, you know, really time for reflection. Um, Amber, sporting the incredible plastic awareness t-shirt, what do you have to add to this? I mean, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts and what you're reflecting on as well. Well, I um, thank you all so much for having me and thank you, um, everybody, the performers, Sound Bath, and all the ladies speaking, and you, Kaylee, for doing this, and Marcy, of course. Um, you all are all incredible, and I'm just so in awe. Um, I, I mean, I could piggyback on everything everybody has said uh, collectively. Um, I have had probably every single emotion um, and kind of distilled it down to some, some really simple things, which is just gratitude for the moment. Um, as Alicia said, I have to keep it really small um, because if I get too far out, the suffering can overtake me and I'm, I'm not capable of being of service to anyone. And, um, 
the present moment, everyone is healthy in my surroundings and everybody I know is safe. And so um, I keep that awareness and that as my kind of touchstone if I'm starting to go future tripping, like what's the world gonna look like? A lot of gratitude for, the, for all of the first responders, all of the uh, governments all over the world trying to do the right thing, the scientists, the nurses, the doctors, the grocery workers, the people cleaning up, people keeping on the electricity. I mean, I've been, I've been praying and thanking everybody <laughs> that's just trying to keep this pandemic somewhat normal. But one thing that's really hit me hard and it came to me last week was after I got through all my grief and kind of collective up and down stuff um, was that the, the people keep talking about economics and losing jobs and we all need a purpose. And the way we live right now is with currency and, you know, money and, and this, this object that we've created and this concept that we've created. And I'm sure this is not a new concept, but it just occurred to me when the people are talking about all this debt and there's like trillions of dollars and bills passing, it occurred to me that it's all bullshit. And we just made it up that, you know, like time is really a human concept and construct. It's not actually, yes, the sun and the earth and the rotation and all of that, those things exist, but we've, we're the ones who've said, this is 12, this is one, this is two. That doesn't, that's, doesn't exist. And it's the same thing with an economy, capitalist, any kind of economy. It's, it's, an, it's something we've created, an exchange, an importance we've placed on something. And that breaks my heart to hear. It's always broken my heart that there's people that are suffering and, and that the injustice of poverty but, and climate injustice and all of that. But this has sort of leveled the playing field in a lot of ways because everybody's at home and everybody's out of work. And I, I'm thinking, is there another way we can do this? Could we just exchange without hierarchies? I don't know, this is getting really heady, but I don't know how to else to do this. <laughs> you're, you're exactly right. And I think a lot of the, and, and now I know why all of you are here because you know, you're all on the same um, kind of pathway, you know, kind of to, to reference Marcy's book, Eco Renaissance, which uh, I have to say a personal story of when I, you know, um, first started as a sustainability reporter, um, and a source of mine, he's like, you need to read this book. And so I read the book and, and a lot of what you're speaking to is these kind of like systems evaluation, systems change, and like, how do things work? And it's at the, you know, the very, um, the finest, most minute point, it's, it's you know, it's like um, being curious and, and, and asking questions and how does this work? And um, Marcy, I'd love it, because you popped up on the screen, so I'd love to throw this to you. Um, you know, you shout out the resources, the brands, your peers, all of the women here in this kind of eco lifestyle movement. Um, how have things changed? You know, has it like always been kind of like, we're, you know, are you guys seeing this? Like, are you seeing how, you know, how there could be an alternative? And I'd love if you can kind of, you know, since we are reflecting right now, um, compare how this has evolved and changed in this whole movement. Yeah, I have, I have a, um, I guess it's a framed photo of me. I got an award that probably like 15 years ago that says like, and it says, my mission is to make the norm the alternative and the alternative the norm. Mm -hmm. And I'm still like on that track, but what yeah. gets me super excited about, you know, in writing the book and curating all of these, as you guys are now experiencing these amazing women who, get it they're they're spiritually aligned with the personal and professional values um they they understand the power of business and the power of change and i think that is why you know i'm like smiling through every one of their answers because you know the it really does take a collective consciousness there are five key pillars in eco renaissance which is uh you know connection creativity because through the lens of design we can change the world um, consciousness community and collaboration and you know when you look at 
how each of us are playing our own respective roles. And you look at, you know, where things once were, where we were all somewhat isolated in this movement, kind of just banging at doors, swimming upstream, doing our own thing. I think the beauty and the power of the internet and social media is it's bringing us all together so that we can have so much more exponential power in our voice in our collective voice. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, even when I started my career and I would go to fashion conferences and everybody would be like, watch your back. You know, I would go to the natural products industry conferences and everyone's like, I've got your back. And I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, how do I bridge the tribe and the boardroom or the tree hugger and the fashionista? Because that's me. Mm -hmm. You know, I live in both these worlds. I want to change the world of style and style the world of change. And so in the early years, those those worlds were farther apart. But I think if you witness every single person that is on this call today, I would venture to say, we all want to look good, do good, you know, feel good. We want it all. We don't want to just choose between style or sustainability. We want yes and. We want yes, style, quality, fit, color, comfort, hand, price, everything. And ethical, sustainable, organic, regenerative, fair trade, Right. And so I've seen this movement over the course of writing the book um, was the culmination, frankly, of, you know, a lot of years of being in these trenches, battling um, the forces against me, swimming upstream. Um, but I feel like it's game on now. I mean, that is the beauty of where we are. It's like, I'm so excited because this coronavirus, I think, has been, as somebody on, you know, who spoke earlier said, it's like the ultimate catalyst because now everybody is resetting and thinking about, wait, when I come out the other side of this, what is that going to mean for me? What kind of choices I gonna make, am I going to make? What kind of Brands, companies, decisions, you know, it's all, everyone's in a sense of reflection and reassessing and ultimately in the name of the book, um, Eco Renaissance, it's a time of rebirth for humanity and one that we can recognize that we can co-create whatever we, world we want to live in. And hopefully that means a stylish, sexy, sustainable, green, healthy planet for everybody and for our children and our children's children. Wow. Thank you, Marcy. I think that's um, absolutely the foundation that a lot of, um, you know, attendees um, would need if they weren't already um, familiar with your work. Um, and I know that we probably have a, a mix of industry and consumers on this, um, uh, attending this panel. So I'd love to kind of um, take a dive into, um, you know, you mentioned, you know, small change, but also Amber mentioned this, Lauren, you know, a lot of you can speak to this. So um, I'd like to just kind of throw it out to um, any of you kind of founders, which is all of you, um, but specific to the fashion industry. So we'll start there. Um, you know, what did you decide to do differently with, with founding your companies, your brands? Um, I'm, I'm curious to hear more about that. Um, so whoever wants to take it away. Um, I mean, I'll jump in. Uh, it's a fashion industry question. I think with red carpet green dress, I mean, we're all women, we're all women. Um, sorry, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, um, that's some universal sign, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we're a women-led organization, which is really dedicated to kind of bringing about action and dialogue in, around sustainable fashion on a global scale. And so I think to answer your question, what we've tried to do is first of all make sure that we have a we don't make sustainability something that is inaccessible to people because if it's inaccessible to people then it's truly not sustainable we want it to reflect the world that we live in we want people to feel like they can be part of this conversation and when i say that and when i say we want people to feel that we want people in across the across the globe to feel that they can be part of the conversation that their voices have value we really try our best to kind of steer away from this kind of concept of saving people, for example. We know that this is an unbalanced system. We know that, for example, the garment workers in the fashion industry is so severely impacted right now. Um, and it's, you know, it's devastating when you really think about the reality of their situation. So what we're trying to do is, even when we shine a light on those groups, 
the language that we use. And I think when we talk about sustainability, it means something different to so many different people. And so with red carpet, green dress, although we try and be clear about what we mean when we say these are the certifications that we're using, or you know, this is the standard by which this dress has been assessed, we also try and look at what this means in different countries. I mean, my family are from Ghana, for example, and some of the designers we've worked with, we've worked with designers and talent from over 21 different countries. So when we talk about things like um, zero waste or natural dyes, we try to do it in a non-condescending way because a lot of countries around the world inherently do these things. You know, they inherently do these things, but they've just never used the terminology. So one thing that's important to us is really how we talk about sustainability. So we bring people in and don't make them feel like they're out of it because they don't understand. And we try and kind of connect with people around the world, as I've said. And then I would say the other thing that we try and do kind of with passion is because we don't think sustainability means just one thing, like, you know, it could be a vintage dress. It could be a dress that's made with a piece silk that's dyed with a natural dye. Every kind of year with our Oscars project, for example, which is one of like six different lines for our organization, we say like, this is an example of what we can do and we want it to be an educational tool but we don't want to eliminate people that aren't using this as their one message of sustainability, you know? You're all welcome into this dialogue. Um, so I think like those are just some of the examples of the way that we try and through our company and through the work that we do, make sustainability something that we're not kind of going out feeling like we're teaching everybody, but we're saying we'd love to be in this dialogue with you. You share with us what you know, we'll share with you what we do, and it has to be collaborative. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it's just some of the ways that we try and do that. No, it, it completely does. It's, it's, and you bring up such a um, pertinent point because it's, you know, for so long, even, you know, um, as a niche, it, it's, you know, it wasn't as inclusive and the movement has really broadened and widened. And, um, and I, 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 you explained it perfectly because I think I often wonder that myself. I'm like, okay, what's the tone here? Because, you know, when, as you all would know, you know, when you're deep in the trenches, you're like, okay, I can say things like gots and I can say things like yeah. this and, you know, eco nil. But now it's, I was so shocked to find that it was um, um, a report from List um, saying how, you know, these are the terms on the rise. This is, these are what like our shoppers are, are looking for. And so eco nil, I'm like, reprieve. I'm like, how do they know? So I think <laughs> it's so, it's so remarkable to see, I think, um, you know, obviously as a kind of newer entrant into this, this space, my personal background is more of the thrift vintage scene, yeah. you know, I, I just, but I, I think it's so true. And I think um, Lauren can also speak to that too, because um, we just spoke on the phone the other day and, um, and, and, you know, she was saying how, you know, I, how, what did I want to do differently? And, and I'd lo love to, for you to build off of that. Um, and thank you so much, Samata. That was Amazing. Get the, we, we have to make like a, you know, a spreadsheet of like, okay, these are the work. Cause I need your, like, help me, help me out. I'm like, sometimes <laughs> do I need to say this or this? Or... I mean, for me, what, a lot of what we were talking about was um, just value systems. And, and I'm taking this time and something in a practice that I do all the time is, is ask myself what my values are. Um, what do I care about? And am I living in alignment with that every single day? I think a lot of values and priorities have shifted as a result of COVID. Um, but I do think that now is the time to ask those questions and ask, you know, even if I can't live in alignment with the values that I have today or the ones I know I'll have tomorrow, how can I set the foundation and the groundwork for living in alignment with those after COVID and as we go back into the world that we had before that will maybe be a little bit different. Um, my, my goal really is, uh, you know, I, I want to show and provide the tools that people need to help to live more sustainable lifestyles. I, I started Trash is for Tossers because I was a person who never asked myself, am I living in alignment with my values? I studied environmental science and I really cared about the environment, but I realized that there's a difference between talking about something and living that way. Uh, so, so living a zero waste lifestyle was my way to connect my day-to-day -day actions with my values for sustainability. So I started Trash is for Tossers to really, uh, to make it easy 
easier for people to access tools. And I think one of the biggest things for accessibility is access to education and information. And so uh, right now, because of how online everybody is, you know, we have more access now than ever before to learning new tools and ways that we can reduce our waste, live more sustainable lifestyles. Uh, we are able to see people that don't have access to sustainable lifestyles or who are in uh, search certain situations that are uh, that need to be improved upon because of technology we have access to do something and and to take a stand and to to use our power as individuals to make change um, you know and, and my priorities have really shifted as well just as a company at package free i started our company uh, to make it easier for people who care about sustainability to live more sustainable lifestyles but as we've grown and developed over the past three years today is actually our third birthday which i feel really proud of mm -hmm. um, it's really <laughs> congratulations that's great birthday. <laughs> happy um, birthday happy birthday birthday <laughs> <laughs> yeah we call it our b earth day uh birthday <laughs> um but you know my my goal for the company has really shifted and to your point what you were just talking about it's you know, sustainability shouldn't, and, and currently it is something that's only accessible to a select group of people. And that's complete bullshit. Sustainability, sorry, that's my dog. Sustainability is a basic human right and one that we should all have access to no matter where we're from, where we live, our, our capital resources, our wealth, um, you know, our gender identity, our race, anything. It's a basic human right. So I'm really pivoting package free to focus on how can we use our leverage and our power as a business and to grow our community to make sustainable products and the messaging and education and tools around sustainability more accessible. And I hope that's something that, you know, especially in this time, we can all think of how can we use our power as individuals and as businesses and as politicians and, and you know, people with power and platforms to not just talk to a specific group of people, but to make these tools available to everyone. Um, it, it really is a basic human right and one that everybody deserves. So, so that's what I'm focusing on right now. So as a perspective, you know, I think um, I can just lend a little bit of a few years to the equation in this way. In 1990, I um, had the privilege of working for the late Doug Tompkins, and I was a clothing designer at Esprit. And everybody came through there in the environmental movement, uh, Paul Hawken and Yvonne Chouinard and uh, Anita Roddick and David Brower and David Foreman. And <clears throat> I sat across from a colleague named Dan Imhoff, <clears throat> excuse me, and he and um, Roberto Cara wrote a book called Paper or Plastic. This was in 1992. So what we started to look at, and the reason that I went to Esprit, was because Doug was asking this question about how are we making clothing and not only how our workers treated, but just really getting to the source, which is, as I was saying before, really co comes down to agriculture. And it's a very sort of cross-cultural and global um, function because we, you know, make clothing for our local community. And then as labor got cheap over here, you know, corporations would go over here to get cheap labor and stuff. And it's also wrong. And I realized then that it was also wrong. And then uh, in working, and I was saying before too, uh, with Sally Fox Cotton, she was one of the earliest organic cotton growers. And then we would talk to, you know, people from Fred Siegel or Barney's and they'd be like, no one wants to pay, you know, 25% more because it's organic cotton. People don't care about that. So <clears throat> when I moved from um, the clothing business into the, our, our current business, which is a natural and organic personal care products, I really gravitated towards that because I could see that I could work with plants and I really understood the immediacy of our connection with the plant world. And, so, and also it was very easy to be part of the natural products industry because we were going from caring about first what we ate and making those standards, then you know what we put on our body. And that you know just goes right back to clean beauty and how we dress. So all of these things have been dependently co-arising, I guess, over the last 
25, 30 years. And I feel like we're in an amazing situation now to come together and to just keep going and supporting each other because the groundswell is actually meeting us where we've been and we're meeting people much more where they are. And I agree with the accessibility piece. You know, I, I was like, do we really want to sell Walmart? Do we really want to sell Target? And then I, I realized, you know, 90% uh, of Americans live within 10 miles of a Target store. Right. And why should, should everyone have better, cleaner products? And if we can make better, cleaner products, you know, with this margin, can't we do the volume and make it at this margin? You know, so we've, yeah. we've been really progressing that way greatly over the past 10 years. But, you know, it's, a, it's all part of a, a bigger, more complex process of change and collaboration and community. Wow, thank you for that, Susan. I, I, I think it's so, um, you know, it, you're so right. It's like timing is kind of everything because like you look at, you know, what the, any of like the top like consultancies have been looking at and they, they say, you know, um, demand is supposed to be double digit by end of this year for sustainability. And then um, often the younger consumer, the, you know, Gen Z millennial are, are saying, oh, we pay a premium too. And then, then you also have, like you said, it's kind of complex because then you have, um, to the point earlier of like, how do you make this accessible? And so, um, and I know that um, there's so many things that go into it, but luckily, like you said, we are in a time where, where this, you know, the demand is there from the consumer, the, um, you know, that, that curiosity and questioning everything and um, really the time to think about systems and everything. Um, Alicia, Amber, I know you both have um, brands as well. And if you'd love to share anything about that, you know, how you decided to lead with values like zero waste and, um, fair trade standards and um, local production. Um, and then we can kind of make a, a curve into to food. Um, I know that we don't have too much time, but I am like so appreciative of all of you um, for your responses and just like engagement. I think this has um, already been so insightful. Um, I can, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I can, I'll start by saying one thing that I wanted to respond specifically to Amber about, about, you know, a trade-based economy, basically. I have a, as I mentioned, an 11-year-old, and when she was about eight or nine and learning about money, she was just like, she, and to this day, she doesn't understand why we do money. She's like, why don't we just trade? Like, I, it makes no sense. And the more the wiser she gets, the more intelligence she gets, she still hangs on to this principle. And I, I agree. And um, I am, though not my company, uh, I'm an ambassador for a, a, um, a company called Wardrobe, which is basically Rent the Runway meets Airbnb, where you rent clothes out of other people's closets. And um, back to that, like, how do we make things accessible to everybody? Well, anybody can rent, you know, a whatever designer and it, we're not throwing things away. We're all sharing. It's a shared economy. Mm -hmm. And I, I signed up to be part of this organization because I love the idea of shared economy in all ways possible. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, as Marcy talks about, it's about that those creative mindsets and new new mindsets to old problems. There's um, one of my favorite quotes is a Socrates quote about like we and it, Einstein said something very similar about like you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created the problem. You need a new way of thinking. And um, with Lavari, we've we've been focused recently about reusing, you know, so, um, for example, one of the pieces from our last collection, um, was a collaboration where we worked with a, uh, a company that gathers scraps. So all old Burberry leather scraps that they would have burned. We then made a purse out of, um, so I'm really excited about how we reuse and repurpose 
um, items that would be thrown away. Like that's my favorite, favorite, favorite thing to design with right now. Um, it's, it's interesting because we were looking at plastics and, um, and that, you know, we were considering doing an item with, um, that was made, you know, a t-shirt made out of plastic bottles and ended up not doing that because as we learned in the supply chain of that, it, you're then still creating microplastics. So we felt like, oh, we, hmm, I can't do, I can't do something that does that. So, you know, it takes an outrageous amount of thoughtfulness and sometimes pausing, like we were about to do this product and then we learned that and we were like, nope, can't do it. And you have to be willing to say, okay, you know, my, my values, as Lauren said, come first. And we, like, I, I live my values. Um, and I guess the last thing I want to say about this is in this moment, one of, another one of the beautiful things is people are seeing how little they actually need. Yeah. How little we actually need to be really quite satisfied and happy. And it's my hope that we can all remember that, you know, as other panels were talking, I think Susan, you were talking about, or Susie, like the joy of just having home cooked meal after home cooked meal and playing board games with your family can bring outrageous joy. And if we can remember that and not look to the latest and the greatest thing to bring us joy, I think it can benefit us all greatly. And I saw someone in the in the chat bar uh, mention slow fashion and, and um, and to your point on share economy, um, less is more. Um, I was reading a report too, and it was like, um, that you guys can tell I'm trying to put in some facts here. I'm like, hey, wait a second. Because <laughs> um, I was like doing so much research for these stories this the week. Reporter in you. I can't help. I can't help it. Um, and I think it was 90 million um, social impressions in the last year for slow fashion. And I'm sure it must be exciting to you all because again, like having that really like, um, having the, the zeitgeist now to really back you up. I mean, last year, I, I think a lot can agree that resale really mainstreamed and it wasn't just, you know, the, curl, the cool um, girl next door, you know, styling with vintage. It was, you know, this is something that a lot of people can adopt in, in these sharing economy principles. Um, and it's so exciting. And um, I'm, I want to kind of branch this into, um, you know, um, and Amber, feel free to jump in here because I know that um, you were really mentioning a lot about trade and how like, you know, why do we do things the way we do? Um, so, you know, what was the thought going into Master and Muse? Well, I launched Master and Muse in 2013. It, it was an online store for responsibly made fashion and accessories. And it, um, there really wasn't anything like that online um, that we could find that was s stylish and fashion forward and, um, we partnered with ukes.com to, to hold the platform and to carry the inventory. And they were a fantastic partner to do that with. And I built the company through the lens of my values, as Lauren mentioned, and everybody has mentioned about talking about values. That was where we started was, was what are the values in which we want to uh, vet everyone with, but also how we want to be as a, as a company and, um, and my kind of reason behind doing, um, Master and Muse was to uplift small brands and to shine a light on, um, responsibly made fashion and accessories to, to show that it, that back then and still today, and even more so today, that the consumer wants stuff that is made the right way and they want stylish things. They don't just want, you know, like a hemp sack as a dress. And that was sort of the point because I had come from a very specific part of fashion, you know, being high fashion that is kind of a small insular world in a way, but they dictate so much of what happens in 
the rest of fashion, you know, they, they kind of, whatever they do, fast fashion follows. And so it, it was really important and it's still important today to talk to them directly to really get them on board because if those tastemakers kind of say this is important and we have to make these changes then um i think you'll see a big trickle down effect um so anyway that was the point of master and muse was just to prove that you could have both style and substance and we we were also doing a lot of education and um and still to this day, that's what I do. The, the store doesn't exist anymore at the moment, but um, I uh, have my fingers on a lot of other pots. So, um, but you know, it, I, I do believe that um, we all ha have collectively an important position and voice in this movement. Well, it's not a movement, but um, in changing the way we make things, whether it's fashion or automobiles or whatever is it, whatever it is that we're building and creating, um, we all collectively as business owners, um, as consumers, as creators, have an obligation to make things better and um, with the thought of, of circularity and how can this benefit the earth and people rather than just our pocketbooks. I have something that I wanna bring up just to that point that I've been thinking about and I don't have a conclusion or like any type of uh, solve for this, but as we see, you know, we're, we're, we're highlighting and paying attention to these essential workers now more than ever. And at the same time, we're seeing huge levels of unemployment as we've slowed down and as we've started consuming less. And, you know, I, I don't know what to do about this or, or how to approach it, but I want to make sure that as we do pursue consuming less, slowing down, that we're also taking the people who are losing jobs with us and who will lose jobs as a result of that with us. Um, you know, the fashion industry is one of the largest employers globally. Um, you guys know the statistics more than I do. It's not my expertise, but, you know, consuming less also means that there are more people that won't have jobs. And so how do we make sure that we're in parallel, supporting education, supporting um, those those communities that will be most affected by us consuming less, ensuring that they have the tools and the resources that they need to, to develop and grow and, and gain wealth and, and power as individuals without these industries that are so polluting and so damaging to the planet. Um, I don't know one way or the other, but I, I just think it's something important to think about. I just want to give like a 10 second shout out because I'm in New York City. I'm in the heart of Midtown Manhattan on 42nd Street and the whole city is screaming, ringing bells, you know, banging drums in honor of all the healthcare workers. We do this every night at 7 p.m. Eastern. It is so inspiring and it's happening right now. It's like almost the background music to what you were saying, Lauren. So I just wanted to share that with everybody because it's really- And that's also my transition. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but changing the way, you know, how we make things, but also how we grow things too. I'd love to get um, Robin and Susie in on this and then we can jump to q and I've seen some amazing questions come through. So we'll make sure to make time for that. Um, Robin, I'd love to start with you. And can you share more about your work and, you know, how did you get to where you are and share about replant? Um, take it away. So I didn't start this way. I grew up in Houston, Texas and was not at all environmentally educated or aware. We moved to Colorado 20 years ago and sort of inklings around the edges started to wake me up. But then we had four children, two of them got sick and all of a sudden I started looking at things in a, in a different way like a lot of people do once they have a child um, and quickly landed on how we've really inherited a lot of broken systems. My work in the food industry was really kind of diving deep into the broken food system. And I quickly realized that this food and fiber dance is why I'm here today, because there is this dance between food and fiber because of how we share the soil. And I think probably in, in no place is that more obvious than the rotation of cotton with peanuts. And so if you think about how we have been growing cotton for the last 20 years with genetically engineered seeds and just a portfolio of chemicals, and we have trashed the soil. And then we're gonna plant the peanut plants into that and grow those peanut plants and out comes our peanut butter out of that same trash soil. And so you think about it, you know, we talk about how we're reusing things. We're gonna reuse people's wardrobes. We're gonna recycle these things every single day that we're planting something in that soil, we're reusing it. And so as I stepped back from that and thought, you know, how can we build smarter systems? What is this gonna look like? This is systems thinking, this is design thinking. 
And I quickly realized that you can't fix a broken food system. You can't fix the broken fashion system with a broken financial system. And unfortunately, we have a really broken financial system. And again, when you step back and you say for any entrepreneur who's trying to raise money, venture capital money, only 3% of that goes to women. And only 1% of that goes to people of color. And that in and of itself speaks to the crisis that we're in because we haven't built that diversity into our system. And diversity is actually the resiliency that we need to see us through. So by hitting this pause, we're saying, holy cow, we, won't, we don't have food in our grocery stores. Thrive Market isn't delivering to anybody's front doorstep. Amazon's not gonna get it there unless those farm workers are in the field. And all of a sudden, for the first time ever, we're realizing how important every single piece of this food web, this fiber web, every single piece of it is. And so it's really an incredible opportunity to sort of step, step back and say, okay, we've inherited a really broken financial system and the way that it's allocating resources. And any of these companies, I don't care if we're talking about Gap or if we're talking about Kroger or if we're talking about any apparel brand or any food industry, Wall Street's grading those guys on metrics from 1985. And those metrics don't work in the 21st century. So you gotta stop and you gotta say, why are we still grading these companies on metrics from the 20th century when we have now landed in the 21st century and we need new metrics? So any of these publicly traded companies, they should be graded on what percentage of your farmland is organic, what loan programs are going into place, what does diversity look like? Because we have hard data and hard facts that when you have a diverse board and when you have a diverse leadership team and when you have women on those management teams, you are going to outperform. Your return is going to be higher. So again, let's, you know, let's stop. We have been forced to stop in this whole big crazy situation. And let's think about how we can build resiliency and diversity into our models as we come out of it. And I think this dance between fiber, it's something that we're actually really excited about at Replant Capital. I have a call tomorrow with the director of sustainability from Levi's. So, you know, we, we get really excited about sharing the soil together because we're standing on the solution to the climate crisis because soil is just such a powerful carbon sink. And so to come together as industries and say, how do we take care of this asset that's on everybody's balance sheet? That's just such an incredible opportunity. I have so many questions I want to ask you about ESG and the financial, sustainable finance, but I know that we don't have time for it. I, oh my gosh, I'm so excited about like, you know, having another new source. <laughs> I'm quivering. I'm like, yes, Robin, tell me everything. Um, I, I mean, to build off that point, you're, you're so right, food and fiber. And really, um, you know, in, in one of our, our cover stories today, we had, um, you know, the kind of highlighting the women and men. Um, and a lot of, you know, obviously the future it also is, you know, um, kind of tracing back to ancestral roots and, and really recognizing um, you know, the women and the practices that we forgot about and regenerative and um, really circular models to, to um, you know, intervene across systems. Um, Susie, I'd love to um, ask you a question about, I guess, you know, what vulnerabilities in Robin 2 um, have really been exposed, um, you know, especially amid this crisis. And, um, and I'm curious also, how did you know, what was, you spoke to how um, the teachers at Muse really made the pivot to, you know, digitally and how do you still have access to, you know, these incredible plant-based meals digitally? Um, so I just want to pick your brain on that and, and then we can kind of move into Q&As. Um, I'm overwhelmed. We have so many questions for you all. <laughs> um, well, I, uh, you know, it's one of those, those silver linings of, um, being plant-based, I mean, obviously this is a huge message to me. It covers so many different aspects of, you know, whether you're doing it for the environment or for your health or for the animals or for your waistline or for your sex life. And, you know, now it's like connecting the dots of what you're eating directly related to disease and how many actual diseases have been created from the way humans have created an imbalance with animals. You know, there, I, I actually had ran across this, a friend of mine sent it to me. So if we're looking at just diseases that humans have created because of our relationship with animals and growing them for human consumption, you have anthrax, monkeypox, 
West Nile virus, SARS, bird flu or avian flu, Spanish flu, swine flu, mad cow disease, E. coli, salmonella, listeriosis, Ebola, Zika virus, and now coronavirus. And um, one of the, there was a, an amazing article in uh, the Washington Post. This was a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking about uh, pandemic pantry dinners. And they had five different recipes. And all of them, and they didn't say anything about being vegan, nothing about being plant-based, but all five of them were in fact plant-based because the sustainable products, the, the shelf-stable products, I should say, are plant-based. If you're looking at lentils and peas and beans and, and grains, different rices and, and quinoas and, and things like that to be able to make where we don't have the luxury of going out to the store every two to three days to get fresh meat or fresh milk. And I think the other thing too, and it, it connects fashion and, and food together because paying attention and Samata, the, our, our CEO of Red Carpet Green Dress, you were so articulate as always, um, but what we are, there are two main things that all humans can do, and this is Earth Day, and it's the big question is like, well, what can you do as an individual to help our planet? And, you know, a lot of people get stuck. They get paralyzed. Well, there's nothing I can do. I can't afford solar. I can't afford to get an electric car. Okay, fine. I can change my light bulbs. I can recycle. But if you're paying attention to what you're putting on your body, whether you're going to clothing swaps and the word sustainability actually is really challenging for me because we don't want to sustain the fashion industry. We don't want to sustain our food systems as they are today. We want to be innovative and we want to change them. So if you're going to clothing swaps, if you're, you know, um, renting, renting clothes as a, um, as Alicia was talking about, um, or every time you sit down to eat. And, you know, yes, there are people out there that are, you know, they are in food deserts and things like that, but they're working on building community gardens and things like that. But every time you sit down to eat, you can either be hurting the environment, if you have a lot of animal products on your plate, or you can be helping the environment if you have a plate full of plant-based foods. So what people don't realize, a lot of people don't realize, and I certainly didn't eight years ago, is that animal agriculture is the second leading cause of greenhouse gases, more than all transportation combined. And especially right now, because transportation is probably at a third right now of what it was before. But as an individual, and everybody that's listening right now, changing one of your meals a day to a plant-based meal for one year, one individual saves 200,000 gallons of water and the carbon equivalent of driving from Los Angeles to New York. So Marcy, you were telling us earlier that there are around a thousand people watching right now. So you can just do the math from there and the savings are unbelievable just by changing one of your meals a day. And that's something as simple as putting soy milk on your cereal or your granola in the morning instead of cow's milk or having a bean and veggie burrito instead of a beef burrito or having tomato sauce on your pasta instead of a meat sauce or maybe using these Beyond crumbles and making your a plant-based meat sauce. But there are things that we can do as individuals for what we put on our body and what we put in our body and in terms of education what we put in our brain that's a you you actually asked a question there that is in the q a so i'd love to ask everyone um you know what is one thing that you know an individual can do and let's also figure in you know marginalized groups especially people of color and the poor let's let's what can literally everyone do what's one thing um so whoever wants to take it away I'd say um, everyone can uh, rewear their clothes 
like at least 30 times and if not more revamp rewear reuse and um yeah it don't discard in the trash recycle it in the proper way I would say I'm I'm a soil junkie, um, and and Robin spoke a bit to you know agriculture. You know Susie did. I um, I would say at every opportunity possible, shop organic, um, buy organic food, organic uh, fashion. Um, it does make a difference. This is not a marketing proposition. This is a fundamental shift in agriculture that we need to all play a role in. It's like all hands on deck. Why? Because current conventional, you know, agriculture, industrial agriculture is destroying the soil. It's turning it into dirt. It no longer is serving as a carbon sink to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere to protect us like our skin, right? Protects us. It's the largest organ in our body. And um, soil is the skin of the earth. So I would say organic, and it's no longer the stigma that you have to pay a lot more for organic. Those days are over, guys, right? So yes. you can buy incredibly affordable organic products, food, fashion, on, you know, from Costco, which is the largest buyer of organic food in America, um, Amazon to Thrive Market. Um, and organic fashion, obviously, yes, and celebrates organic. We want to make it accessible and affordable for everybody and to break that stigma that, you know, it's for the elite. It's not. This is about connecting agriculture and popular culture to protect our <clears throat> soil and our planet for our children. <clears throat> and I would say um, no fake fragrance mm. that plant, you know, all of our um, products and many other people's products start with essential oils and they come from plants. They're grown all over the world and distilled, you know, with art and soul and culture of where the plants are grown. And that connectivity is really good for us because our sense of smell is sort of connected to our heart. It bypasses our brain because it's so instantaneous. And I think that um, really honoring plant-based products in every way, but especially in personal care, perfume, because it just ripples out into the chemical industry, how we're packaging, and every other ingredient and how things are made. You're muted, I think. Oh, Salada. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sorry about that. Um, my answer would be the one thing that everybody can do is look inside their garments and look at that label. What and how our clothing is being made is impactful, not just in terms of sustainability and on the environment, but one thing I learned kind of working with Susie is that it's impactful on our bodies, on our endocrine system. And there's a whole amount of research that's being done right now. And that was done years ago, even by Greenpeace about kind of some of the dyes and chemicals used in the production of clothing. It's like, it's some of it's known to be carcinogenic, endocrine disruptors. And so what you can do is look inside your garments and preferably opt for those kind of natural, and I, I think I'm echoing Mar Marcy here at least, kind of natural textiles, natural fibers, which are better for your body and better for the planet. For a red carpet green dress, we're about to launch three textiles later this year and they're all plant-based um, textiles. Well, one of them is 100% plant-based and they're derived from wood cellulose, totally renewable um, sources, because we learned that the way that textiles are being produced is just not sustainable. It's all from non-renewable sources, doesn't biodegrade, you know, it takes thousands of years, if never. So I would say one thing we can all do is just look inside that label and just do that research and find out what all of this stuff means. We do it for food, you know, we look at the back of something and we look at things when we're on the diet or whatever it is. We take that time to do it. So we should do the same thing with our clothes because it's just as important. And no, don't underestimate your ability to understand things. I think everyone's covered, we've covered food and we've covered clothing and we've covered soil and smell. 
So, um, and I, I'm gonna save trash for Lauren, um, cause you know, that's- it. I'm not even gonna talk about trash, which is <laughs> weird, but <laughs> go for it. <laughs> to me in this moment is embracing this moment. And for example, when we all found out we'd all need masks, so many of us looked, you know, all of a sudden we're like, oh, that rag, oh, I can make something in my own home and then have a steam about it. And it's to embrace the creative thinking of reuse mm -hmm. and, and find joy in it and find the creative joy in reuse. This is, you know, what if we find joy in this moment? What if we find possibility in this moment? What if we think about climate change as this awesome thing as opposed to this scary thing that might happen? What if we take the presence of this moment and make it awesome? So that's my one thing is like, keep on looking around your house at what can I reuse? What can I not buy new again? What, how much can I repurpose and recycle and imagine? I'll, I'll, that kind of inspired what I'm, I'm thinking, which is, you know, asking the question, what new skill can I learn and how can I teach it to somebody younger? Um, so how can we teach children, you know, how to make their own products, how to sew. I mean, most people my age don't know how to sew, which is insane. I have a hole in my sock right now. I know what to do about it. Um, so learn a new skill, learn how to make products. Often making your own products is so much more affordable and accessible than it is to, uh, to buy them in a store. So that's an amazing skill. Um, so what skills can I teach myself and how can I pass them on to others who, who will be the next generation of change makers in the world? Um, and then the next thing I think is, you know, asking what your values are and, and trying to live in alignment with them every day. And finally, I, I interviewed this amazing woman, Steph Shep, um, this afternoon. And, and I asked her, you know, what are your values? And she said, always trying to be my best every day. And I loved that, especially right now. How can we wake up and try to be our best every single day? How can we try to live in alignment with our values, put our best foot forward, be the kindest, most wonderful, most giving, most loving, most grateful we can be? Um, and I think that's some, something that, that everyone can do. Yeah. Wow, that was so amazing. I know that we went way over, but feel free to, you know, um, I, I don't know how to connect connect everyone. Um, that's mostly um, yes and's role, so I'll let you take it away. But um, I've been so honored to you know moderate this and, and hear each of you and your values, your ideals, and you know your views on change and, and systems change. Um, I thank you so much um, for allowing me to do this, and I thank you so much to our, our panelists. Um, we don't have the validation of applause, but feel free to clap by your laptops um, and. I'll turn it over to the also, I just say, I've been looking up to all of these women for so long, so I feel really grateful to be in your presence. Thank you so much, Marcy, for organizing this. Well, you know, it's so perfect because we're living in this modern day Star Wars, right? Where the dark and the light forces are kind of at odds. And I've named all of the women that are here today my Illuminartists. They're the light warriors. They're the ones who are shining the light. And you know, the darker it gets, the more you see the light, right? So the first thing that inspired my journey almost 30 years ago um, was reading a book called Living in the Light. And I think that's where it starts, is tapping into that light energy, which is that love energy, which is that soul energy that we all know is there and we just have to tune into it. So I am so grateful for every single one of you. You're all incredible earth rock stars, life rock stars, eco warriors, illuminartists, um, and just keep doing the great work that you're doing. Um, you're shining the light, you're brightening this world, and we all have to keep joining, you know, together and everybody who attended today, hopefully, you know, you will learn something and continue to plug in to the outlet that we call, you know, the ego renaissance or, you know, Earth Day or plant-based living or whatever we want to call it. It's all, you know, spokes in the wheel of 
this uh, transformation that we're all living through. So um, thank you all. I love every one of you. And I want to just close out. We have five more, six more minutes, but I just want to end with, um, you know, my reason for being, my inspiration um, as a mother, uh, my daughter, I, you know, when you, for all of you who, who have kids, um, you know, you never know what will come from, you know, how they will turn out. Um, both of my children happen to be performers. Uh, my daughter is, um, is somewhat of a, uh, an earth herself, which you will soon find. Um, Sam Bear, who is her friend from high school, who I've watched the two of them grow up, sing many duets together back in South Florida, where Jade was raised. Um, and they wrote an original song to uh, sum up Yes And that they're gonna share with all of you today. Jade founded an organization, a nonprofit called Entertainment for Change, where her mission is, you know, it, she's dedicated to, to educating young people about the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, inspiring a global transformation through the power of entertainment. I'm so proud, I'm honored, I am blessed uh, to present to you my little earth, <laughs> uh, James Arrow and Sam Bear. Hey. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, no, uh, so grateful. We've been friends for over 15 years. And my mother is my greatest inspiration and my reason for being literally. So <laughs> I'm really, I'm really grateful. So we wrote a little jingle about Yes Sand. This is it. You ready? Oh, yeah. Misconceptions at the forefront. Promise this is not some green front. Love yourself. Love the planet. Stylish and sexy. We just branded it. Modern and ethical. Yes Sand to life. Cool and conscious. Yes Sand to life. Curated and connected yeah yes and to life artistic and accountable yes and yes and to life ecosystems like humanity shine a light on our insanity must we go up to healthy choices let's empower our true voices oh modern and ethical yes and to life And, yes and to life. You guys can sing it with us like that. Yes and, yes and to life. No compromise in going green. We made it easy, made it clean. So join yes and our tribe and family. Family. Everybody. Oh, modern and ethical. Yes and to life. Yes and, yes and to life Gotta love your mother earth Yes and, yes and to life Gotta put your mother first Yes and, yes and to life Protect me baby Yes and, yes and to life Love your mother, love your mother Yes and to life Thank you guys so much <laughs> So I just, I want to just say thank you guys. That was amazing. They wrote this literally, you guys, like in the last 48 hours. Um, <laughs> but I, I do want to say thank you to all of my amazing panelists, Soul Sisters, uh, to Alex for his inspiring music, um, Sarah for his sound bath, Kelly for moderating. Um, every one of you is just a force to be reckoned with. And thank you all for being here, sharing Earth Day with us today. Thank you from Yes And. And again, yes, we want style, quality, fit, color, comfort, price, health, wellness, a future. And we want to be ethical, sustainable, organic, fair trade, 
and it's no compromise. So thank you for sharing that vision with us and for co-creating a stylish, sexy, sustainable, green chic and healthy planet. And uh, again, happy Earth Day, happy birthday, uh, and um, make every day Earth Day. So have a wonderful night. Um, cheers and, and love, love, love to everybody. Yes. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Bye. Any last